We're live. Great. <laughs> live on YouTube live. <laughs> Doing it. Oh, oh man. All right. Here so let's jump right in. Sorry, everyone who is watching right now and was trying to watch when we were live streaming earlier. Not sure when this video is going to come out, hopefully later tonight. Um, but yeah, our friend Thomas has been very generous with this time. We've been on the phone with him now for almost three hours. <laughs> Nothing hour. but time right now, right? <laughs> Nothing but time. Apologies. Right. We've just, yeah, we're, we're just had a lot of, you know, just some technical difficulties with setting up the stream and the CPU on computers and internet connections and things like that. We definitely want to keep the Sandbox Sunday thing going. Um, and we'll, we'll work out the kinks as things, as we start doing more of these. So hope you can tune in to a, more live streams uh, in the future. We know it's Monday, but we're still calling it Sandbox Sunday because um, in the spirit of Sandbox Sunday, when we would all get together on the weekends and rehearse all weekend, when we were not all living in New York, um, after rehearsals were done on, on Sunday afternoon, we would get together and just hang out and, and just chat and drink and be merry. Um, so sandbox sunday was started and then as our lives got crazier sandbox sunday started being on random days throughout the week when we started when we wanted to hang out um so it's a monday but we're just going to still call it sandbox sunday so anyway thomas kotcheff thank you so much for being here thanks yeah. for having me this thomas yeah um we are gonna use this time like i don't know hour hour and a half or so to talk a little bit with you about um, the music that you've written for us, you know, not, not just for us, percussion music that you've written for other people, music you've written in general, um, some things you're working on right now, um, and also just kind of what you've been up to um, during this whole crisis that we're in. I know, I think you, you've probably already said this because we, we streamed for like a little bit um, and you, you kind of told us a little bit about what you're up to, but just for the purpose of this being recorded now, right. um, if you want to just chit chat a little bit about how you've been doing, what your response has been like to the whole, uh, everything that's happening in the world right now. I know it's been really interesting for us to kind of readjust and just curious about, about yourself. Yeah. So, um, when, uh, we first had this kind of shelter in place and the quarantine started and everything kind of started getting canceled, uh, I was uh, had the nice distraction of being uh, commissioned uh, with uh, Jennifer Coe's uh, Alone Together project, uh, which I think it is 40 composers. Um, she commissioned to write short pieces for her to uh, be premiered uh, in this time right now. And it was actually a really great distraction on week one to be able to write something. And uh, I also was extremely optimistic at that moment, um, thinking that it was going to be a two-week uh, quarantine and then we'll all be back out into the world, you know, normal b behavior returns. Um, so I finished that piece off and sent it, sent it to her. And then at that point, uh, the news of what was happening in the world had taken a very, very different turn and it just seemed to get worse and worse and worse. And, and at that moment when I realized that, you know, things are going to be like this for a long time is when I just got extremely depressed uh, and I couldn't find the energy or the willpower to do anything. Um, I was on my couch all day, in my bed all day. And, you know, in my normal life, having a week to work with nothing scheduled on there would have been the absolute dream yeah. uh like could just knock off like all these projects and things and then in this scenario with the world in its current state i just was absolutely depressed and couldn't do anything uh so i kind of wallowed in that for about two weeks um and uh i i say wallowed as if it was on purpose i was just wallowing um in my uselessness <laughs> and <laughs> unable unable to do anything and then uh as th this week Sort of, or I guess last week, the, the fourth week of what would have been the quarantine, I just said, you know, I have to do something. Like, I'm going to make a schedule for myself and I got to, you know, get back to some kind of uh, flow and rhythm to my life. I just need it. Um, but I can't just sit on the couch forever and play iPhone games, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I made this nine to five schedule, which includes an alarm and includes showering, you know, getting up, having my breakfast at the same time as if I had a normal schedule and then getting to my office and starting to work. And actually it, it made a big improvement for me just getting myself back uh, to making things again. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, totally. I think. Sorry, and go ahead. No, I was just going to say that 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 that's such a that's such a good idea about a schedule. I mean, the thing the thing that I've been struggling with is like most of my instruments aren't here, and so the thing that I do all day is I go to the studio and I do whatever I'm doing with with the instruments for for that day. Right. Um, and and just not having that, it's been it's been difficult for me. I, I think I'm going to try to be inspired by what you did. It's been difficult for me to set a schedule like that for my time at home because it's so easy to just spend the entire day like working on that press release or working on the or whatever. And then you find that you've actually just been reading the New York Times or playing <laughs> the drive or whatever the hell it is that you're doing uh, for right. the entire day. And then, oh, it's six o'clock. So maybe it's time for a beer. I don't know. Who, who <laughs> and then suddenly it's just another one of those days and they all seem the same. It's, it's tough. Right. Yeah. And it's actually kind of, uh, for what it's worth, Thomas, it makes me feel a little better to know that if even you, went through a little bit of a, of a down spell there. I mean, for, for people out there who don't know Thomas that well, he's one of the most upbeat, high <laughs> energy, go-getter people. I mean, to give you an idea of who Thomas is, he's been on this Zoom call with us for about three <laughs> hours now. And Thomas <laughs> is the kind of guy who is there with you through thick and thin and, and helps you see it through to the finish, no matter what that finish is. And, and you know, uh, so, so I think to know that, that even someone will, with your disposition and outlook on life to, to still kind of have, have uh, difficulty at the beginning of this time, it, it helps me to kind of cope with my own feelings a, a bit too. Yeah. Yeah. That's think, interesting. I was talking to someone the other day who said that they were actually having the total opposite reaction where they were like, Oh, I'm so excited all this time on my hands. I'm doing all this stuff I could never do. And I was like, you know, like, what? Like, that's not, that's not happening to me. And it's interesting, you know, everybody's having like very uh, individual sort of reactions to uh, the sudden space, you know? Right. I think what's interesting is like the things that I have to do, like, I mean, I have a, a, a massive list of things that need to be done. Like I have scores that are backed up that I haven't edited forever. They need to be fixed. My website needs to be fixed. Like a lot of work is there. I just had the issue with just getting any motivation personally to do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. But man, I feel like what you said, if I could just have a week to get all these things done, I feel like when I'm busy and like life is normal, I'm just like, oh, there's all these things that I need to do or I want to do. And I'm just like, if I just had more time, I'm like, I'm like, you know, I put my nose in the air and I'm just like, I'm just, if I just had more time, I would be able to get all these things done. But now I have all this time. And I mean, I think I'm getting things, some things done, but um, it's definitely, I'm not reacting to it in the way that I thought I would. Um, and it makes me feel like I'm going to cherish the time that the the free time I have to do things when I am busy. I'm going to cherish that time maybe a little bit more, you know? Right, right. Oh, man. Do you think, you think we're all going to miss this free time when, once we're back to normal? <laughs> <laughs> I think what's interesting for me, what I've noticed is in my normal life, watching TV or a movie at nighttime would be like, not a scheduled event, but it was like, I got my day towards there. It's like, oh, like if you just work all day, 8 p.m., you can crash on the couch and watch a movie, you know, it's yeah. great. But now if I do that, I almost feel like mad at myself. I'm like, dude, like, you, what, are you, what are you doing? Like, you should be working right now. Like you have all this free time in the world. Like why are you wasting watching a movie for, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah it's true. There's also this thing about how we're all doing this together. Like, like, if we were in our normal lives, I, I think I, I often have that in my normal life. Like if I sit down and watch a movie, I'm like, wait a minute, there's so many things I could be doing right now. And I know that that other person is working right now. So I should be working <laughs> whatever, but everyone is going through this exact same thing right now. And I think that that's kind of interesting. I think we're all, at least I hope we're all able to cut each other some slack, you know, like I think everyone is processing differently. Like I've seen some people that are practicing a ton like they are, they're working on fundamentals, they're making recordings, they're doing all this stuff. And that's right. amazing. And mm -hmm. then other people are like, no, like I'm not playing right now. I'm taking a break and I need that break. And uh, I, I don't know, it, it's cool to see how, how different people are sort of navigating this. Right. Yeah, I think what my gut response to it was because the only time I've had days off, they've been literally that, like a day off. And so the way you use a day off is that you've only got a day, so you can't do more than a day's worth of stuff. And so when this started happening, I was like, oh, it's a day off, followed by another day off, followed by another day off. And the next thing I know, it's like a week of days off. And I'm like, I can't just keep taking these one day at a time. Like, that's not 
going to work. I'm not going to get anything done. And so I started thinking of it in swaths of time. Now I actually have this kind of week arc, which is cool. <laughs> like I've never really experienced weekends before with like, the music life. You're kind of like weekends maybe is the hardest you ever work. Um, but now it's like I'm kind of sculpting a long, a longer range swath of time where it's like, okay, if I start this today, then by Friday I'll have it done. And that like that sort of thing has been really a, a new a new endeavor. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, totally. do, do we want to do want to take this back and talk a little bit about about how we know Thomas, how we first met Thomas, and all the all the work that we've done together? Let's do it. So, yeah. I, who, I, I remember being in ear training with you, Thomas. Ear training, Doctor Orlando's class. Doctor Orlando's class, right? Uh, that's right. You were a year older than me, so you were. Did you were transfer to Peabody? Yes. Yeah, so that puts you, you were a sophomore or junior and I was a freshman or sophomore. Right, 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 right. So this would have been like 2007, uh, 2008. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I think the, the first thing I remember about you is that you were just like, you were, you were more excited than I think anyone else in that class to be in <laughs> Every day you were just so pumped to like be there doing the sightseeing that, that we were doing, you know, and that, that really made, made an impression on me. But I don't think we worked together. Well, you, you, you were a performance major back then, right? Yeah. So uh, I didn't even know that you were a composer at all. No, I, I started composing at Peabody as a okay. freshman. Uh, and then through taking lessons at Peabody um, as a minor, you know, lesson student for four years, by the end of it, I was like, I think I want to pursue composition. Uh, but, uh, my degree is purely piano performance from Peabody. Um, and uh, I think when I, when I was making a choice to do composition afterwards, uh, Benjamin Pasternak, my teacher, well, he, he asked me legitimately, is this what you wanna do or is it a fallback? You know, I guess assuming that I couldn't cut it as a classical pianist maybe. <laughs> um, and I was like, no, I really wanna do composition. And he was like, great, well then let's get you graduated. Was yeah. the base of the sentiment, you know? Yeah. That's so, just as a side note. That's so cool. I didn't realize you studied with him. Um, he's he's amazing. I, I remember I know. This, this performance. Were you around when he did um, the Bernstein piece, "The Age of Anxiety"? Yes. Also, that performance. Like I will never forget that for the rest of my life. That was an, an absolutely sensational performance. I mean, uh, there's been so many times I've seen him play where I've been like, that was the best I've heard of that piece, and I'll never forget that performance. You know, like of like ten times with him. Yeah. It's amazing. He's amazing. Did you know him before you got there or were you just kind of placed in his studio? You no, know, it was actually really lucky. Some, uh, a teacher's, a friend of my, my teacher's said, oh, Benjamin Pasternak's great, put his name down. And I was like, great, okay. I had no idea what I was doing. I just put his name on my shoulder. This is the guy I want to be with. Yeah. And he accepted me and, and there we go. It was amazing. That's so cool. And you were going out there from LA, right? That's where you had grown up and where right. you had studied up until then? Yeah. And that's so funny that that is such a competitive studio at Peabody. <laughs> like he has so few students and like everyone there like kind of wants to, I mean, the piano faculty there are amazing, but he is, he is one of the highly regarded <laughs> faculty members. That's so funny that you can like end up like unbeknownst to you. <laughs> I know. I was just, um, it's, it's funny because when I put his name down, I think I did Google him before I put his name down. <laughs> Uh, and I just was like, all right, that seems pretty good. You know, and I, and I heard his recording of the Copeland Sonata. Um, and, you know, um, and then I got to his studio. I was, the whole time, he, he has about three undergraduates in his studio at a time at, at most. And I was one of them. And I definitely felt like I was the runt of the litter through my time at Peabody in general. Like, you know, I have a hundred pianists, maybe 110 pianists. I was probably ranked about 109 or 110 <laughs> the whole time, you know? Um, and mostly because, I mean, obviously I could play the piano, but I just wasn't um, really cut out for that repertoire. It just never really spoke to me. I mean, by that repertoire, I mean like older music, mm -hmm. uh, Chopin, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms. I love it. I love teaching. I teach it now, you know, uh, in all my courses, but it just, I never felt like I had something to say about it when I played it. I was just trying to like almost uh, like, it's like doing a rudiment or something, just like get something done, you know, and mm -hmm. just like complete the task of learning this piece and then play it the way it's supposed to be played. Uh, and then it right. wasn't until I started really 
um, embracing my love of American music and of uh, living composers is where I actually felt like I had something to say and something to, to do and to, to be creative as an interpreter. You know, I never understood what that meant until, you know, much later in my life. Yeah. Well, yeah so is... sorry, sorry. I was going to say that that's super interesting. I, uh, you know, we, we obviously, we don't have that kind of repertoire, but with some of our older music, I think that there is a sense uh, sometimes that it's like we, or, you know, especially when you're a student that you want to just kind of do it, do it right or something. Like right. there's almost, uh, there's sometimes there's like less freedom with the older stuff because there's like this sort of uh, expected kind of way of doing things. I was curious, uh, like, so at what point at Peabody did you decide I want to compose something? You woke up one day and you like, you wrote something down or what, what was that like? <laughs> I, I think actually before I went to Peabody, I was um, doing a lot of improvisation. Like I had Disclavier and I would just straight up like press record and just like wail on my instrument like crazy and then play it back like, oh yeah, that's sweet. And just like, you know, <laughs> and just like, you know, I love that stuff. Um, and then when I went there, uh, I uh, was like, you know what I should do? I should write down an improv. I just write it down, see what happens. So I wrote down an, an improv, like just straight up like transcribed it. And then I was like, okay. And then my second semester at Peabody, there was a course offered called Intro to Composition. And I was like, great, I wanna try co composing. Like I've been improvising, I, I could try this. So I went for the class. It was with um, uh, Tom Benjamin, who he wrote actually, oh, not this theory book, uh, this theory book down here. <laughs> uh, he's like a Peabody legend and in the theory ear training world, the legend, cause he's wrote all the books. He was teaching um, Intro to Composition. And I signed up for the class and it was me and one other girl who took the class. And on the very first day, he, um, Tom Benjamin walked in and said, unfortunately, this class is canceled because only two of you are in here and I, we can't run a class on two people. But he said, if you guys want, I will give you guys lessons, minor lessons, just I have to register for a minor lesson instead. And so I was like, great, I'll do it. And so I signed up for minor lessons with Tom Benjamin and he was my teacher for the next three and a half years through Peabody. And just, you know, we started off with writing solos and duos and, and that's how it all got going. Wow. Wow, that's really cool. I didn't know that story. Yeah, yeah it was, it's, it, in the beginning, I was really doing a lot of like, you know, improv on the piano that's kind of like semi-tonal and then writing it down, then going to lesson. And he was really just, he's got so much uh, technique in, in, in his like, you know, obviously he wrote these textbooks. So like, it was just about understanding what it meant to take an idea and develop it and to stick with your material and, you know, and, and obviously I went from there, from being with him to applying to uh, my master's at USC. Uh, so, you know, it was, a, it was a very, very fast uh, uh, learning curve. And mm -hmm. I, I, I think I developed it quickly, but also when I applied to, to USC, they most certainly took me as a beginner. Like, um, I've, I've talked to, uh, Donald Crockett, who's chair of there about it a lot. Cause I see the kids that come in there now and I'm like, these kids are way better than I, than I ever was applying to for the master's program at USC. And, you know, I guess it, it speaks to being a great teacher or a great educator. He said, yeah, you were a beginner, but we saw how fast you learned. Like we saw that, you know, you gave us, you know, a year of, of pieces you'd written within one year. And from like that, from the, where you started to where you, you brought in that last piece, it was like, whoa, this person's like really developing. Mm -hmm. And also he said the fact that you were um, a, just a, a pianist as well, a musician that you had like, you know, that in your fingers and in your brain also meant that you could, you could, you know, play and had musicality. And so I really also, you know, Tom Benjamin, a big part, but also the fact that USC took me in as a beginner and, and, and helped me get to where I am as well is, is a big, really big for me. Yeah. I have another question. Um, so obviously you, you're you still a performer and you're right. like one of these composer performers who somehow does both of these things <laughs> well. I'm curious if you, how, how much of your time right now is composing? How much of your time is uh, other performing things? And how much of your time is like, all the other things you also do. Yeah, you know, um, I feel like uh, between the composing and performing, it really kind of works. I would, I would love to say 50-50, mm -hmm. 
in some ideal world, but it's never that. It's like 80, 20 flip flop constantly, you know? So like, I'm just like practicing like crazy for a big concert and doing like, that's like all my time. And then when that thing's done, it's like, oh, and then the piece is due in three weeks. Okay, so I'm gonna, you know, spend five days straight writing right now. And then so like, it's a big, these big swings in time. Um, I think I've I've really tried to work hard to get better at time management um, for all these things. You know, and really trying to schedule like long term over the year how it's going to work my, my general flow of learning pieces and, and sustaining them and taking on big new projects of com- composing. Um, but it's hard. It really, time management does get tricky. You know, I just did this big um, Frederick Zhevsky performance. It was a 75 minute solo piano piece. And essentially, I had to take off to do that. Um, I took off three clean months of, of composing to do it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the first, four months of the project where I was learning the piece I was also composing simultaneously within that and then when I was when I had about three months to go before the all the shows started coming up I just had to take time off and and just practice yeah there's something to be said for that though like I I I mean I'm not a composer but but I sometimes feel like in my own life I'm unable to split my brain between practicing multiple huge projects at the same time like sometimes I just need to focus exclusively on something and I feel like uh, that that just might be the way to do it you know that you might not be able to be creative in a compositional way when you're trying to play a 75 minute piece and record it the day after you you know that just right. all your time and that's that's okay too yeah but I also for me I know that um my brain is constantly like working on things when like I'm not doing them so like if I have this big piece that I'm writing for like I mean I wrote uh, a percussion duo recently which we, we might talk about in a minute uh, but you know the the impetus for that project starts six months before I, I've written a note and the whole time it's like going through my head I'm, I'm, I'm figuring things out I'm, I'm like constantly thinking about the piece and what I want to do with it and while I'm practicing my Jevsky it's like still in there bouncing around mm-hmm. and then when it comes time to do it it's like things work themselves out in the last four months in my head and I'm just like more ready I'm ready to go you know cool wow so that's that's that that is the positive and also you know being a performer you know, I draw so much inspiration from my colleagues like that to me, like the reason why I love doing what we do and the reason I think why I'm also, uh, I have a whole nother life of doing like this broadcast hosting and radio hosting. So I love our music. I, I play my friend's music and like, it inspires me. It brings me joy. And then I'm playing, I'm like, Oh, that's a good idea. I should do some of that idea. And I, I want to go with the idea too. And, and I'm just building and building and building off their music too. And to me, that's like what it's all about, you know? Yeah, that's really cool. That, that that that's a really nice point. Like when I when I think about the different parts of your career, like one part that always stands out to me is the the way that you're a cheerleader for for our art form and our community, and you really embody this thing that that we try to embody as well as much as we can. That like whenever someone else succeeds at something, that's actually a good thing for everyone in our community. You know, someone right. coming up with, with an incredible idea in, in a percussion piece is awesome for all other composers because now they can like be inspired by that idea and do their own thing with it. Someone inventing a new instrument or getting a new gig or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it's hard to put that into practice, but I really think that that you honestly believe that you're, you're honestly just right and happy about what other people are doing. And that's it's, it's true. You know, I mean, obviously there, there are like any human being, there are times in my life where, you know, my ego just fights me and it's like, you get jealous, you get upset, you didn't get something you think you wanted, something falls through. But, you know, also there's times like, you know, when I'm like, you know, the last two pieces Viet has written for a percussion, I literally, when I, when I heard them, I was like, Oh, like, yeah. I was like, I was like literally <laughs> running around my room, like cheering. Like I was so pumped. Like they actually excited me to like, to hear this, it, this level of invention on a piece of music, you know, the, the piece for you guys and the piece that you wrote for Jeff on the, on, on the snare drum piece. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, this is awesome. You know? Um, yeah. I love it. I just love it. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good, uh, segue to talk a little bit more about the percussion music that you've written um because uh i think that there is you i think you've you've created a real voice for yourself kind of in the percussion community um i think i I see a lot of students playing your pieces now and and it's really cool you know since we put out some videos and things um yeah i mean i think the first piece that you uh wrote for us that we played was hammering yeah um throwback throwback yeah <laughs> it was actually well it was for norfolk 
Right. Um, for those for the people watching who don't know that, uh, Thomas and, and the four members of Sandbox who are actually slightly different members than are here right now. OG Sandbox. OG Sandbox, that's right. That's right. Um, we were at Norfolk Chamber Music Workshop together um, in Connecticut, and Thomas wrote a piece, a mallet quartet called Hammering. Um, then kind of reworked it, uh, made it a little bit longer um, for Sandbox. I think that was like a year or two later. Um, right. Made a video of it, played it. Was that your idea long. to make it longer? I think it was your idea. Really? I thought so. I, I feel like, I honestly, I have this distinct memory in my head of, of you coming up to me and being like, because you played the original. You I really you, did not. Oh, you did I, not. I, I, Ian did. You did. Yeah. Ian, Mari, uh, Garrett. And who was the fourth person? Um, and, oh, and um, Googie. And Googie. Googie. Nice. Um, and, but I feel like I remember Vic coming to me and saying, um, would you consider making it longer for Sandbox? That might be true. I think we had talked about it. We, we, I mean, we had, we didn't play it as a quartet, but when we heard it at Norfolk, we were like, oh man, we really want to play that piece, you know? Um, right. And, and we it was five it minutes in the original version. Right, right. Right. I think that they asked you to write, because there were so many pieces. Like we, we right. were playing Reich Mallet Quartet and then each of the composers at Norfolk wrote their own Mallet Quartets. And I think that you were asked to only write a five minute piece. At right. The time. Right. Um, and it kind of felt like, I mean, it was such an amazing piece with like these distinct sections, but it almost felt like these sections ended artificially. Like they ended because the piece had to be five minutes. So we right. were, would you, we, we asked you if you felt the same way, you know? Absolutely. And I absolutely did too. And I remember, cause I remember that was one of the first pieces that I, um, and actually I don't do it often where I, I, I redo a piece. I redo, I mean like, I mean, that's a drastic redo. I mean, making a piece that's yeah. five to seven is, is substantial. But I remember like, um, when I got the, to, to reworking it, I was like, okay, so the first section needs like a little bit longer Then I added the time there. I was like, oh, but that's longer than the next thing needs to be a little longer too. I was like, okay, I'll that. And then it kind of like, the, it's like an accordion. Like you, you pop one <laughs> bit out and then they also need to be popped out too, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but you know, uh, I, I do remember that uh, on those first performances where the, the, the five minute version, they did feel like they were just going by so fast. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the piece goes by fast, you know, it goes by, but the original one was like, that it was like over yeah yeah, yeah it's true yeah, it, it was the hard piece i also remember that because at Nor norfolk we were learning so many pieces I, like i think i've just blacked out that entire <laughs> it was so insane but i remember your piece i mean your piece at the end especially like it has lips like it's really fast and people are playing in unison like even though it's it's chromatic and kind of dicey in terms of the harmony that you're, you're playing the same notes as other people so they're yeah. really obvious when you miss them and i can remember bob giving us a really hard time about not playing all the right notes <laughs> actually, i will say oh, go ahead i actually played that i pl i think i played it must have been the five minute version but i think i played i was at peabody and i did it the fall after you all premiered it at Norfolk and I did it with like a group of other Peabody undergrads and we spent like a maybe a whole semester I, I don't know a significant amount of time working on this piece yeah. and it was super hard <laughs> for that group of people and I remember coming back to his sandbox actually and being like oh awesome like this I you know I had I had kind of gotten a taste of a little bit of it but then I think I remember coming to the new seven minute version being pretty psyched about that did um you play the same part at Peabody as at the Sandbox? I don't think so. Mm. I doubt it. He didn't get he didn't get a choice with the parts in the Sandbox. <laughs> <That's true. Yeah. laughs> if you haven't noticed, <laughs> I do remember. Um, uh, I, and this I have to give you credit, Ian, because remember you wrote the ending, the last I, measure. Oh, you, you wrote the last, so many different the quiet part. The yeah, because the original ending had no that um ba da ba da bum the very last measure with that little tag at the end. Yeah. And I remember you um, at a, a rehearsal in that back room behind the, the main hall, like that really yeah. weird back room. You said, you were like, uh, Thomas, you know, I, I'm not sure about this ending. It feels like it needs something, you know, and you brought it up. And I was like, you know, I love when performers gave me ideas because like usually their ideas are better than yours and they're also the ones you have to interpret the music and, and play it and and they they know the piece better than you do most of the time like they know the notes better than you do um anyway so you said this thing and i was like oh uh, i was like what are you thinking and you're like well i think that we should do the 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 the, the theme that they're gonna know on the end and i was like okay like and then i was like let's hear some options and like and i was like on the beat and off the beat and like loud and so we went through all these options and then 
Um, and then we voted on it in the room. Wow. Um, we, we, and I was like, and we came with, down to three options. The one I had, the one that you suggested, and then another one, which is your idea, but on the beats, like, dugga, dugga, dum versus, mm, dugga, dugga, I think, something like that. And yeah. then everyone voted for Ian's option, and then we went with it. <laughs> I had forgotten that. <laughs> I had no idea. Wait, so how, how did it end? How did it end the way that you had it? What, it just, it? boom, ga, boom, ga, boom, ga. That's oh. right, right, right. Dugga, dugga. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's boom. cool, because I like how Icarus that piece ends with a little tag at the end. Right. So when really, I, hear, I mean, not that you were thinking about hammering, but when I hear it, I think of hammering. No, I, I do. I've done a lot of tags and maybe Ian really ushered in the, the era of, <laughs> of Kotchev tags. Cause like <laughs> all my pieces need them, you know? Yeah. 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 The middle era. <laughs> yeah. So was, was hammering like your first percussion piece or you'd done some before that? That was the very first. Uh, oh my god! Yeah, were you like still an undergrad at that point. Or were you already in grad school? No, I I had just finished my, my master's. You just finished your master's. Okay, mm. cool. Um, you know, I I grew up loving percussion music. Um, I think my passion for it really began with seeing Stomp and Blue Man Group, and just thinking that that was the best thing on on earth as a kid. And then at Peabody, you know, seeing uh, PPG. Uh, play was like life-changing really for me you know uh, Ian knows this and you guys know this too but you know uh, when I was a sophomore I saw Ian perform um, third construction uh, and for me that experience I it changed my life basically like uh, I actually started crying in the audience like I was so overwhelmed with the experience I just could not believe a piece like this existed yeah. you know it's it's like hearing like a language that for once like spoke to me it was like at that moment I was like oh like ah, ah, like this is it like this is what I've been looking for this is this thing you know <laughs> um and uh yeah I mean I still think it's the greatest percussion piece like yeah every read I don't know it's definitely in my top one the top two <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's hard to top that one. Who were you? Who was that with, Ian? Um, that was uh, Adam Rosenblatt, other nice, other uh, OG Sandbox member, Candy Chu, and oh, yeah. Greg Jukes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. It's Remember that? Solid group. Yeah, it was oh, amazing. Yeah. And so you know, from there, I just always had this like love of percussion music. Like it has stuck with me. I started just like devouring repertoire. All the, obviously all the PPG pieces and then beyond just, you know, um, it's really nice with percussion is you can get this thing where you actually know almost all the repertoire. Like it's actually, you know, yeah, it's like, you know, if you do your homework, you, you can get there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's you're true. not, you're not so far behind if you start now. <laughs> right. Um, and then when the Norfolk thing came around, uh, I just feel like I hit the, the, the lottery because I was like, great, we can write these mallet quartets, we can write these two percussion, two piano pieces, like this is exactly what I want to be doing and want to try. And it was actually the first time I also for myself real, um, tried to embody like a more, uh, a different approach to, to formal structure. You know, a lot of percussion pieces, I don't want to say are devoid of form, but they just go from A to the end there's no like you know structure that's like super obvious sometimes mm -hmm. you know um and they're and they're built in different ways like you know like with with obviously with cages con um constructions and like and how he's using time and rhythm and, and rhythm patterns um and so for me i was like i can embody this idea of of just releasing what i have done before with form and trying to find new ways of construction constructing music you know that's really interesting because i remember when we did the video with Justin with part and parcel, I remember part of what you were saying was, um, you know, when this was, I had a bunch of thoughts and some questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, and one of them was a comment that you made in that video, which was, you know, I think of something or I like see somebody going like on stage, like you're a very visual person. You know, you see somebody going on stage and like doing a certain thing or like playing a certain mm -hmm. instrument or doing it a certain way. Um, and you're like, oh, like you hear that and you're like, I like that. Like, I'm going to write that down, you know? Right. Um, and I see that. I know we were going to talk a little bit about the duo, um, a, a section of the duo that you have for, for Matt and Jeff. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that maybe that was a good example to kind of show maybe that process a little bit. Um, I definitely hear that, for instance, like in not only that one, but that one and that too. 
Um, <laughs> nice work. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> um, where there will be just like these moments when I'm just like, Oh, I like, I could, I could see you dreaming that up, you know, and, and hearing that and imagining that and then writing it down. I guess I was curious a little bit about what your, your process is like for when you sit down to write a piece, like how you think through those sorts of things. Like if you really truly try to visualize things and, and put them on the paper, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to say a mystery that's that's like hanging over like composing as if it's like some sort of secret art, you know. But really, in my mind, it's it's not so secretive. I like to think about it like the way that we learn to write an essay, or the way you learn to draw a picture. You can learn to compose. If I said to you all right now, can you draw me a red barn on a piece of paper? You'd all dream up in your brain what a red barn would look like and then do the best you can to get on the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And then because we're not all artists, it, the drawing won't really match what's in our brain. We'd be like, ah, like, ah, it doesn't look the same, but uh, it's, it's there. I, I, I wish I could do that. You, you try and explain why you missed the drawing, you know? Yeah. I feel like that's what we do with the composition. Like if I asked you guys all to imagine an oboe melody, you'd come up with something in your brain. You'd be like, mm, you'd probably see, see some weird thing in your head. And then you want to get that out on a piece of paper. And, the more training you have, the more you can match what's in your head to what's on the paper, you know? Yeah. That's such, a, it, that's such a great analogy. I like that. Yeah. Whether it's like um, in your articulations, your dynamics, your, your metering, whatever it may be, you know, with all my students, they have awesome ideas, but it's hard for them to get it from their brain to the paper. Cause they're not, you know, that's what we work on all the time. Um, and so uh, when I, I'm working on, on a new piece, I'm always thinking about the ensemble and just saying, I mean, percussion's a very different um, beast because you actually are building the ensemble. So it's, you really have to imagine it, but let's just say it's going to be a string quartet. I'm imagining that ensemble and like thinking like, what do I want to hear them play? Like, what, what are they playing? And, the, and then I start to like run through ideas and, and scenarios in my head. Like, is it fast? And like, oh, it could be fast. And I'm trying to play it out how to go, you know? Mm. And, and I don't have perfect pitch. So it's not like I'm like, you know, Mozart sitting in the cafe writing down, you know, notes, but I'm, I, it's all through my imagination. Um, and then same thing um, when I'm also working with the percussion music and, and, and building these setups, I'm literally sitting there with like my little percussion map, um, uh, which I've drawn by hand being like, okay, so I'm standing here and like, I'm playing that as, as you know, maybe I should put it to the right over there. Cause if it's over there, then, then that thing makes more sense. And I'm trying to like figure out how it should look and how it should be to, that to be executed correctly. And that's the keyboard you're building for the piece, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, we've been chatting for a little bit now. I want to give people an opportunity to hear your music if they haven't yet, you know, um, should we, I know we're recording, so we're not actually going to do it right now, but I'll drop in a video at some point. Should we maybe try to do that now with hammering? Yeah, maybe with yeah, hammering. From a hammering, what we were talking about. Great. Yeah, do the, it. The, uh, the Kachev tag at the end. <laughs> That's right. The Kachev tag. Enjoy. <laughs> no, the, the Ian tag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I had another question about hammering. Um, Fire. Uh, when it's interesting to hear that that's the first uh, piece that you've written for percussion. Um, and that is, you know, that has a lot, of, obviously it's all pitch, you know, pit, mm -hmm. uh, we're playing on mallet instruments. So I'm wondering if there's like any, 
Well, because like the, the way you have written that piece on mallet instruments, it feels really good. You know, I think it, it, there's definitely some challenges like for sure, but it like lays really well. And you, as for you being a pianist, I think there are certain um, ways that you could write on a marimba if you're a pianist that wouldn't work, you know, right. Just certain sonorities that like kind of clash in weird ways or just don't sound right. I'm always amazed if I take like a, a marimba solo that I've learned and like play it on the piano. Um, like I always used to think this about con variations, you know, I would like play it on the, on the piano and I'd be like, it sounds like a different piece, you know, just like right. with overtones and all these sorts of things on, on the mount instruments. And there's something about hammering that I think works really successfully, you know, with the way it lays idiomatically and also how it sounds um, like really nice open sonorities, but also like ones that were like really clash, you know, with like right. the fifths, like the stacked fifths chromatically. Right. Um, I'm wondering if there's like piano, if something from your piano background helped, helped to inform that, or if you were just like studying pieces or if you just got lucky. Or if you were I just think lucky. that's a mix of all those things. I definitely got a little lucky because um, <laughs> I was just so young and it was the first time ever writing for mallet instruments. Mm -hmm. I do remember um, there was a composer at Peabody, uh, Peabody, at USC, who was a percussionist. And, uh, and he was playing vibraphone in this piece. And I just went to him after the concert. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm working on a piece for vibraphone. Can you like, just give me like a minute of like, talk me through some stuff on it. And he just said, oh, you know what works really great for vibraphone? Fifths. He's like, mallets love fifths. And I was like, really, fifths? He's like, yeah, fifths. They're like, great, like, look, watch. It's so easy to play, like it fits really well, look at this. And you can do, you can do a fifth and a second above it, like this great harm like that. I was like, oh. That's pretty oh, good. Okay. So yeah, nice. just, yeah, that's the piece. <laughs> um, and I, I, mean, I, 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 oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I think it's like it's funny you're describing it in that way, but I think for from our perspective, if we were all going to say one thing about your music that works really well, is it always feels really good. Like you have always figured out how the piece is going to feel, and some of that is because you you know, you build your setups in your house or you have your map or you, you know, you've figured out all these other things. And this is something we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. We've been talking with different composers and things we've noticed in pieces and things we love in pieces. And that's one of those things that always stands out to us when a composer has figured out, you know, if, it, if the piece asks for this, when the composer has asked how that setup might actually be set up, right? that really changes our relationship to the piece, you know? I'll never forget getting uh, coming to your parents' house in in LA and like seeing in your in your room like your your like uh, no throws or not only that one but that one and that too. Uh, sorry, we call it no throw. <laughs> I'll never forget like finding your setups like in that room. Like your desk bells were like all over the place. You had like little you know you were like oh yeah this is my setup. It's crap, but like it totally works. And like for that piece, you were like you were taking drum set lessons. You That's know right. like <laughs> so like get better like at whatever you know and I feel like that's a testament to like how how much you dive in uh to a piece and that's like always so evident to us it's like always our our feeling when we're, when we're playing your music it's like oh this just like feels right this just like works right I remember My when I was like when I was ahead. writing a, a part and parcel um I was actually at Aspen at the time when I was writing it and I was building my setup, um, but all I had were actual um, glasses, like I mean, like sort of like wine glasses and, and like real like kitchenware. And I just kept breaking them and kept bre and, I, and I keep I kept putting a new one in its place and then breaking that one. And I kept putting a new one in, and um, I I knew like in like it's like that physicality is so important to percussion. It's like I don't care if I kept breaking this, I gotta keep putting it there, like so I can feel the run, I can feel what, what it might feel like if someone had to do it in real life. Yeah. That level of commitment is amazing. I mean, we, so when we first started these Sandbox Sundays a few weeks ago, it was this like this general composer conversation about things that we had noticed in all these pieces that composers had sent us. And we talked a lot about this, about, about the, the unique composers who take the time to really learn the instrument that they're writing for. And with percussion, of course, that means new instruments every single time they're writing a piece. Um, but I, I, one of the other guys said this already, but it really does show when we're playing your your work, it's so clear to us that you've taken this time and this effort, and it just allows us to to skip the annoying logistical steps of trying to set everything up and figure out what our stickings are going and all this stuff, and go right to the music making of the whole process. Like we can just skip right to those steps because you've sort of helped us figure out the logistical part of it. And I'm not trying to say that your music is easy because it's definitely not, but but we're not wasting any time. 
uh, with those things trying to tell you that things are impossible. You've already done that part for us. Which right. Is yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, obviously the best inspiration for that right now would be Andy Akiho, who maybe is the absolute king of just building these setups that you're like, what? Like, I, how could you have come up with that? It's like, I mean, half of writing for percussion is just like building the instrument and, and how you build it changes the scale. You know, like if, if you're putting, if you're alternating glass and metal, that's a different scale than going for glass, for metal, you know? And also if you want to get that, the first scale and you have the second setup, you have to do this versus this. You know, <laughs> and I, I always look at, at any piece that Andy builds and I'm just like, so just in awe of how you can take that ensemble and just twist it in a way and it just changes it to a brand new musical level. Like you just, it opens up a whole other world of what notes you do and, and what sounds you get. Yeah, man. And it's not even, I mean, he, he, he is a percussionist, uh, but it's not even because of that. Like, I think for us, who we, we also obviously play all these instruments, when he comes in with a new thing, it blows our mind too. Like he, he's just creative on that level. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Well, well, we just mentioned part and parcel. Is that what you're thinking, Vic? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I was thinking even just generally, we we're talking, you know, it seems like we're talking a little bit about like notation and percussion keys and stuff like that. Um, I was thinking in part and parcel specifically, I'm thinking about the composite rhythms. Um, that Thomas has written out above the the opening of the piece, you know. Um, Should we maybe my... play people a little snippet of it first, or? Yeah, maybe let's let's play the opening. Maybe the opening of part and parcel, and then we'll, we'll we can show the score as well. With the score, yeah, yeah, with the score, yeah. Yeah. or with the part, I guess. That's right, with the part. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I forget where I got that from. Uh, I remember, I, I think I played a piece that I had this like really difficult, um, like fitting in part and the composer given me a composite line. And I was like, that's it, man. Like, that's how you get the results you want. Like if right. I can just, you know, if I could just sit there and have it pre cued for me, you know, and just follow along and then play my note when I'm supposed to play it, that cuts my rehearsal down by like, I don't know, 50 hours, you know? It's true. Yeah. yeah. It just goes that's along huge with like, in in no throw the second movement all right. that kick drum stuff kick drums, I feel like that saved us yeah like, yeah you know well here can we, can we throw the score up can can, can we take a look at that a to... part, part, part and parcel yeah or, or a part a part of part and parcel part of part <laughs> and parcel yeah yeah i have it up here um a pop up part a pop up part okay. yeah sorry have we have like we have all these shortcut names for your pieces <laughs> so there's like there pop and no throw there it is <laughs> We'll see how this also, looks on the on the video. I might also just like throw this in the actual video. Cool. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I love how uh, little little behind the scenes on part and parcel. This parcel just showed up on our doorstep one day, and we looked inside, and it was a piece of music by Thomas Kotcheff, <laughs> who right. I I mean Best package ever. Maybe, yeah, maybe I just hadn't gotten the memo or something, but like all of a sudden the guys showed up in the studio and they're like, Oh, we have a new piece. And I was like, what? Like, like, yeah, Thomas just wrote us a piece and he just sent it to us. Like, let's, let's learn it. And like, yeah. Just totally out of the blue. Is, is that kind of how you did it, Thomas? But I think this one was out of the blue because I, um, <laughs> at this point um, I was at Aspen and I remember, I think I, I may have texted Ian and was like, 
Ian, I'm going to write something for, for Sandbox. You don't have to do anything with it or not. And I was like, you know, you could play it next season or not. It wasn't like I was like begging for you guys to, to do it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just said that I had this idea for a piece. And, you know, and Ian had, had been to, I don't remember if he's been to, been to LA before that or at that point or yeah, at some point. But, right. but, but weird, but me and Ian had been talking about different kinds of pieces. And I was like, I, got, I, got, I said I had an idea for a piece, which was like this, where the setup was variable and you could like, you could, you could change the setup to make it very like, and, and I called it a tray sized piece. Like you just make it like really small like this. Mm-hmm. You just play it like, you know, little, mm-hmm. little teeny chopsticks. Um, and so that was left as it was. And then like six or eight months later, I was like, yeah, I, I wrote it. I wrote the piece, you know, here it is. You guys can play it or not. Like, you know, let me know what you think, you know? And then you guys sent back, oh, we're going to play it at, uh, at Kettle Corn. I was like, oh, great. Like, that's amazing, you know? <laughs> uh, and that was probably back in a, in, a, in a time in all of our lives when, when not that much planning was needed. Right. Like you could just send someone right. a piece and be like, "Oh, we're gonna play it in a month." I'm like, "Cool." <laughs> <You know? laughs> now it's like time. years of years of, of planning goes into to pieces into into commissions. Right. Yeah, but so I mean, the the choice that you made. So so the instrumentation for this piece is not fixed. Like you you, you tell us um, different groups of instruments. Like the, this is a wood instrument. This is a glass instrument. This is a pitched metal instrument. This is an unpitched metal. But after that, it's totally up to us. Um, which is kind of like a big decision to make. You're really, uh, you're ceding a lot of the control of the sound of the piece to the performers. So like, w- was that was that like an initial idea? Like was the whole conception of the piece based around that choice or did, or did that come later? That was built into the piece. You know, I think for me, the, the joy of writing for percussion is that when you go to the, the, the first rehearsal or when you go to the concert, you're hearing that, groups or that person's version of the piece and it's going to always be different it's not going to be the same bongo it's not going to be the same you know tam or whatever you wrote for and every one of those instruments sounds different and that's beautiful and like to me that's exciting and i i love because i you guys know my music and and i've written a lot for just like junk metal and that to me is my favorite instrument on earth because it's always different and some groups make it like really junky and some make it a little more you know uh we'll say orchestral you know, and that's awesome. Like when I hear I'm like, great, like, and, and for them, it makes sense. And, and for me, you know, cause I love interpretation. I love hearing how it makes sense to someone that they did that decision and I can ask them about it. They can talk to me and they, we, we can talk about their decision. And if I, I rarely will feel strong enough to change their, their instrument on the, on their setup, you know, unless it's really the wrong thing. But, you know, I, I, I for me, that's like the joy of percussion. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And I, I feel like one thing, so we, I, I don't think you guys, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've ever played part and parcel other than the way that we play part and parcel, like with the instruments that we use, except that one time at NYU that Terry or no Vic, that was, it was that your group that, that played at NYU? Oh yeah. It was Terry. It was Terry. It was Terry. Terry. And yeah. that, that, that completely changed the setup. Um, but I feel like it would be a cool thing for us to to try it again that way. I mean, we came up with a version of it that we really like, but it's not actually such a small tray that you play with chopsticks. It's like a little bit of, of a bigger thing. Um, so it, it would be fun to do that. But I, I, I've loved seeing various performances o- o- over the years of the piece that have been different in, in some key ways. Right. I mean, I, I think, you know, what per- performers aren't, maybe they are taught this, but aren't, they don't take enough like uh, liberty with is their role of interpretation and, and drawing conclusions. You know, like, I mean, the reason why I love Zhevsky so much and his music and people who play Zhevsky is he just opens up the, the, the score. I mean, every piece has a chance for improvisation with the Hermann. It says optional improv here. <laughs> and, and just the fact that he releases that and says, if you believe something should happen here, you do it. But if you don't believe it, then you just go on and you keep playing my music, you know. Um, and a lot of interpreters of Zhevsky, you know, play it the way he plays his own music, which is very, we'll say, liberal with with the following the rules of the page, but also making, I'd say, making informed decisions. Like they're saying, oh, this part should go faster for X, Y, and Z reason. There's no Chalron on the page. There's no faster tempo marking, but it goes faster for a variety of reasons they believe in. And that's what we should be doing when we interpret pieces, new or old. It's 
you guys know my music, so you know maybe what I want. And I'm sure you're doing a lot of stuff intuitively, like, oh, you're putting these together in your own head and just reinterpreting them and, and playing them. Um, but young performers should be encouraged that to make informed decisions based on what they see and what and 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 the music of the person playing. Yeah. And I feel like you as a performer, like like that opinion that you just stated, like it has so much to do about you as a performer because you literally have to do that every day when you're interpreting other people's work, you know? Right. And that, that's such a, do, do you, do you think all composers, not that all composers should be performing all the time, but do you think that all composers should have some kind of performance experience to get in the mindset of it in that way? I, I, I tell my students that it's really important. Um, I just say to them, you should try and play someone else's music that they've written for you because you'll understand what it means to have to absorb that material, how to learn that material, because oftentimes it's like it may be misnotated or whatever, and it could be hard to read. And then you have to learn what it means to, to, to go in front of people and represent that material. You know, and that's the biggest thing which composers don't understand is someone else has to go to bat for you at the end. It's not you up there, it's them. And they're the one making the pitch saying, this is good stuff, take a listen, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's almost critical that, that composers understand what it means to perform and also vice versa. Perf uh, performers understand what it means to compose where someone just spends like potentially six months coming up with a, with a, a lick and then you're like, this looks awful. I'm not going to play it. And it's like, well, I spent like six months trying to write that one lick, you know? <laughs> and so there's, a, there's definitely that, that balance that, that I think for me, I understand pretty well. And I'm still learning on both sides. But younger musicians can definitely empathize with both sides of the equation. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really hard thing. I and mean, it must be, I'm not a composer. It must be hard as a composer to, to spend all that time on something and then give it up to someone else knowing that they're actually in control of what an audience is going to think of it in some way like whether they do a good or bad job interpreting it or or just executing it could determine whether or not you know johnny whoever watching the performance thinks thomas kachev is a great composer or not like that's right not in their hands i i've only had really one experience in my life uh where i had a premiere and it was really played so different than what I had written, I felt embarrassed because I realized that there's no way for anyone to know what this piece is, but based on what just happened in front of them, which was not the piece. And so I felt uh, like it's not, it's not my music. And so in that scenario, like, you know, a piece like anything that you guys have played where there's documentation of it, it's out in the world, it's been played a lot. Like you, someone could go out there and just do whatever they want to the piece, but people still know that there's other versions that exist that have been put down in a, as an artifact. You know, but it's those premieres that can definitely be scary with people you don't know and they don't play it the way maybe that's closer to what's on the page, I would say, is important, you know. You know. I, have a, I have a pivot question, if that's okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, so you're a composer who we have kind of worked with over many years and we've done kind of many, many different projects with. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about uh, like working closely with performers and then also just like how how maybe this or your process has changed like over time for for writing pieces for us because obviously your last piece was this huge huge thing that was uh, I think you know a different type of piece than uh, a part apart right no part apart is, is Vix <laughs> part and parcel part <laughs> parcel <laughs> we can edit that no leave it uh, in that's in there <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> A lot, a lot of parts uh, in the name. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, it's funny, you know, for me personally, I, I look at my rhythms and I see that as being where I've developed the most and what I'm interested in exploring. Like I yeah. look at, you know, the rhythm in, in hammer ring and I'm like, okay, like, yeah, you know, <laughs> very, it's very on the grid. Um, and you know, it's, it's groovy. I like, I, I love grooves. You know me, I love grooves, but uh it's 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 great and then and i think that the hammer ring is a nice snapshot of who i was whatever that seven mm -hmm. eight eight years ago nine years whatever it was it's a good snapshot of who what, what i was interested in pursuing back then and then i look at part and parcel and i similarly see uh some stuff that's a little stiff for me now 
but I do see things that I was interested in back then. Like I, I do love, you know, uh, four, six measures, five, six measures and, and triplet quarter notes. And that hasn't left me, but I actually have really gone, gone away from that. But there was a time for like two years, which I was like obsessed with a four, six measure and, and a five, six measure, two, six. Um, right. And, and then I look at, you know, uh, not only that one, but that one and that too, which was 2015, uh, 16, whatever it was, one of those two years, which, you know, and I still, and I'm still going, okay, like, you know, I, I know for a fact that I was not that interested back then in a quintuplet. And now I'm Jeff obsessed converted with it. You. Yeah. Jeff converted <laughs> me and I'm really interested in, 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 in that rhythm. And, and that's great. You know, like, I think that um, as a composer, you continue to develop what you're fascinated with and what you think for your brain needs exploring. And, and the piece I wrote for, for uh, Icarus duo, Matt and Jeff um, of the Icarus quartet, I feel like I really just went to the nth degree with, with pursuing what it means to write a quintuplet and metric modulations based on quintuplets and just like went to the, all the way to the end of that spectrum to satisfy is like, okay, so I explored that now. And like, and then I'll look back at that piece, I'm sure eight years from now and be like, wow, what was I doing? Like, I was like so obsessed with this one rhythm, like for that, that one moment in time. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, no, I, kind of, I mean, it, I was actually thinking of their piece when I was asking it because uh, when, when I heard a clip of that particular piece, it feels like you, you fell really deep in the crevice of just like, <laughs> <laughs> like kind of percussion rhythms right you know? like the the rhythms actually in that piece uh some of them i'm listening to and i have no idea what it is it's it's actually like it's some of it is so complicated i have no idea how it's written down like it doesn't sound uh, right obvious like it'd be really hard to dictate it you know <laughs> yeah. and sometimes like that means like you have you have fallen deep into like rhythm land you know <laughs> um and i just like i feel like i noticed that from here we go sorry i'm i'm pulling it up keep talking yeah today. pull it up oh yeah no no i was just like noticing that from from hammer show us rhythm land piece. oh yeah so that's the, the so what you just pulled up there is the um the sketch of the setup um and we're talking about setup so um i was really i think i think with the percussion duo i was i think you're you're in my mind, I was like, this is the, the open, the real opening up of the bag of sharing instruments. Cause only two of them. So you could just have them play like the same instrument together, you know? So I was like, what on my setup can they share? And my initial concept was actually that they would just be, it'd be one line of instruments, kind of like, um, drumming part one, uh, it's like one line down the middle and they just kind of all play it like that. And so that maybe that was like the drawing of like um, on the right where you see like a, a line of like, you know, things. And then mm -hmm. I was like, no, what's probably better actually is they're, they're the lines in front of them, like a giant, like massive xylophone keyboard, but they're all playing it. And then I was like, oh, maybe a good idea would be to have it be also inverted. So like they share the instruments in the middle and then outwards, it goes backwards, uh, low to high for um, percussion on the left and then high to low percussion on the right. So you see that there on right. the left where your mouse is, you see a, uh, a mirrored setup of the log drum in the middle, break drum in the middle, right, and, right. and then like a, a, f a mirrored keyboard going outwards. Um, right, yeah. And then um, that, of course, then once, once I had that locked in my brain, it's like they're going to do this, this mirrored flying V setup. Then the piece starts to write itself because you, the scales you're writing are different all of a sudden, like, you know, and how everything looks is different in, 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 in performed. Yeah, totally. I also love that it's on like a, like renew your healthcare. <laughs> yeah. <piece of> paper. <laughs> That's all I had in front of me when I was writing. And so this actually um, is a mixture of sketches, but also of me writing down licks of other people had, had it played um, like online or other pieces. Mm -hmm. So like I wrote down like flam five is, is, is like a, a, a rudiments thing. I just wrote it down. I was like, Oh, it's really good. That's a good little rudiment. I like that a lot. And, yeah, yeah. and then like the one beneath that is like a, an accent pattern I liked on the 32nd note level, you know? So this music is not, um, mostly is not mine. Um, uh, but oh, I, I see, I see. But for me, a big part of my process is like finding parts of 
other people's music that inspire me and, and make me believe like, uh, and what I want to pursue. Mm-hmm. And um, so you see uh, where your mouse is that, that, um, that, that oh, five, yeah, that yeah. embedded five rhythm that c- came from, uh, uh, oh, this guy's uh, a YouTube percussion guy um, uh, in the drum line world. Oh, uh, Wooten, Will Wooten. Uh, oh, uh, John Wooten. John, John Wooten. John Wooten. That's a John Wooten little lick, and I heard that actually. That, that little lick, I put in a piece that I wrote for New Morse Code first. And I was okay. like, that, that, that embedded five is really nice. I'm gonna like put that in the New Morse Code piece, and um, and um, you know, Mike has amazing chops, and he's like was just slaying all these rudiments that I was writing for him. So I was like, you know, what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say that same little. Um, embedded quintuplet inside the the beat lick and put it in the piece for new morse code i mean in for uh icarus duo Mm -hmm. and then just go even further with it and just like keep you know pushing on that inside five and above Mm -hmm. it you see the inside seven you know same with the seven on the inside right um so i guess like for me it's like i i'm always leaning into inspiration with from other composers and 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 saying oh that lick that's awesome that one beat of music is so awesome how can i do that one beat for like a whole section (laughs) right (laughs) yeah well should we listen to it should we should we put up a little clip of that video on there because i think today's the the first unreleased video right yeah coming out soon um probably within the next couple months is this video and what what's this piece called sorry it's called servo servo for the icarus duo yeah I was just thinking like you've uh, maybe this isn't true. Actually, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like you you found some performers who you like writing for. And it feels like you've written a few pieces for some of those people. Like I, I feel like there's another piece for Icarus also. Yeah. Icarus Quartet. Right. right. And then I, I don't know, just like I get the sense that you've uh, you've done follow up projects with with performers before. Yeah, you know, I think that for so the Icarus Quartet is a good example because, like, you know, they commissioned me for that piece, that that two piano, two percussion piece, and then I went to the video recording session, and I was sitting there, and I was like, I have an idea for a piece for percussion duo. I was just sitting there, like, think, as I was watching them play my piece for me, I was like, I got another idea. And for me, like, once it starts to fester in my brain, like, I just can't let it go. Like, it's just gonna be there, and I'm like, at some point, it's gonna come out. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna do this piece, and. And what I also began to realize too with, with composing, it's like, so the piece that I wrote for, for uh, Matt and Jeff Servo, I mean, that was just our collaboration, no commission, just like, hey, I wanna write you this piece, I wanna make this, this project happen because I obviously believe in it and, I, and the piece has to come out. Um, and for me, when we were at the recording session for that video and, and they were playing the piece and obviously you know how good they are and, and their dedication to the music, I was just, I. I felt that feeling you get when you play music and you just feel completely satisfied by the artistic experience. And I was like, this is worth 500 commissions for this feeling of writing the piece that you believe in and having players come in there and play it at 120% effort, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And so to me, that, that's what it's about and what, what I want to be pursuing. I don't care about you know, a, a measly commission fee. I want to be working with people I want to work with and I want the, us to build something together. You know? I think that's, Man, like, I think that's such awesome advice for, for a lot of composers and young composers especially. You know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of young composers who are like maybe bummed that they're not getting the commissions they're hoping to get. But I feel like you've, you've taken this total roundabout approach with your career where you're just like, I have to write this piece, so I'm going to write it. And then hopefully those performers love it and they're going to play it and they're going to record it. And, you know, you, you sort of like, you just made, made things happen for yourself in a really inspiring way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 maybe just also how I how my brain kind of works, like you know, and how I just have to, I, how I just kind of function and do things, you know. Like, I mean, another example is like when I wrote the piece for New Morris Code and and um, with Hannah and Mike, and I'm working with Mike on this percussion part, and I'm just thinking like, I, there's a definitely a solo piece I have to do right based on this. Like, I have a solo piece in mind right now, and so now I'm like, I'm gonna, and so now we're we're working out how to do it, and we're working together on this new solo piece. But for me, three years ago. When I'm sitting there working in them with their in their studio, it's like the idea is there, and I'm and I'm like it has to come out at some point, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, uh, I think that's what I always try and, and tell my students um, is to uh, is to really pursue what like you you have to pursue. Like it's like it's something inside of you that's like I have to do this thing, and and I can I can do, it. and it may, maybe it may not be like you're going to break ground with it or it's like the next best thing to happen to music. But if you believe you have to write a piece for five cell phones and it's inside of you, you got to do it, like go and do it, like, you know, make it happen. And when you follow that passion and you follow those like intense feelings in your brain and your heart is when you're making music that's like becomes a value, you know, down the line. Mm. Totally. Well, I'm, I mean, when I see you put the effort in to like, you know, build your own setup and like, create your own like scales with like specific instruments and things like that. And like, you really see like the dedication to it is infectious, you know, and for us to, to get that, I think that we, it translates to us preparing it, you know, Um, like we want to put as much time and dedication in that you have clearly put in, you know? Um, Yeah. I can can really, really get behind the whole, uh, you know, if it's what your heart, wants to be doing in that moment it's almost i can really feel it strongly now when we're all like forced to just find meaning in whatever it is we do with our day um, right I, i'm really kind of letting that guide me it's like whatever feels re- meaningful which sometimes is like banal email answering but it's you know you find a way um but even random things that i never thought i would be doing right now but it's like i'm kind of driven to do it and it's not to say that that thing is going to be amazing, but it's probably going to lead to something that, you know, it puts me on the right path, you know, right. Following that, that kind of inner, inner star or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's tough because, you know, like w- the way we grow up in conservatory and with, with training is you, you're growing up following someone else, a teacher, a mentor, another group that you look up to, another composer you look up to. And, and so it's built into us to imitate in and, and the learning process. That's how we learn. We, we imitate our, our, our mentors, you know? Yeah. And, and then at some point though, especially with composition, you have to pursue what you want to pursue, you know, and, 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 and move in a direction. It's like, oh, I have to do this one thing and I don't really know why. And you, you might not know why, but you have to do it, you know? And those are the pieces and the composers, I think, that, that we all look up to. Like when you look at Andy's music, I mean, I obviously I, I love Andy's music and it's been an inspiration for me forever. It's like, I, just, I see it, I'm like, this is someone who's just doing what he has to do. <laughs> you know, there's no one telling him, hey, you know what's a good idea? Try this thing out. No, he's just doing it, you know? And that to me, like always is, is how you innovate the instruments they're working with and also just the genre. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely an extreme example of the thing you've been talking about. Like, like when he's doing something, he is only doing that thing. Like, he's not doing four pieces at the same time, right? That he's giving everything to that. And also about what you just said about, like, if you're going to do something, if you have an idea and you want to put it out there, uh, that, that, that you, you just do it because it's what you literally have to do. It's nothing to do about the money or the opportunity or whatever. You're right. doing it because it's in you and it must get out. And I think that, 
I think that, that there's something to, to be said about that and something about the quality, the consistent quality of your work uh, that, that every single project you do is something that you are behind like 110%, you know? Yeah, try to be, try to be, yeah. yeah. Well, should we talk a little bit about your, uh, your magnum opus for, for percussion quartet? Yeah. Not only that one, but that one and that too. Um, it's funny, I was just thinking about this piece because I know we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it. Um, when I first wrote it, it was supposed to be my dissertation from my doctorate degree. But um, I started the piece and then I w did not get far enough in my classes slash I delayed too long in my education to have it, the timing be right. So I ended up just writing this like 30 minute piece uh, just because, you know, um, it was supposed to have, you know, academic meaning, but didn't end up having that. Um, uh, you know, where I started off from with that piece was first I was kind of plagued by my own idea because, you know, the scariest thing about percussion music is making the setup. You know, that is, that's actually, I would say the first 30 to 40% of the work is just figuring out what you're writing for um, and drawing the maps out. And because once you, once you've committed to it, you can't go back. I mean, I guess you could, but if you're really committing hard to it, which I think everyone should be doing, it's like if you're writing these like these um, these massive licks on a very specific setup, you can't just change out the setup because then the massive lick is is now different and doesn't work anymore. So I really I remember specifically with um, the second movement of not only that one uh, with the drum setup, just sitting at my computer and my little drawn map of all the drums being like, is this it? Like, is this all the drums? Like, is this, you know, cause once you get going, like you can't go back. And I was like, okay, let me just try, let me just, I'll build it again. I'll build it again and see if it's right. You know? So I was like, okay, you're going to get that drum. You're going to get that drum and, and reassign all the drums again. Um, and, and yeah, so that, that in a way held up working on this piece, but that's always part of the process of, of writing, even for like the, the most recent one for, um, Jeff and Matt, it's like, I cannot really get going until I know how it's going to look to make sure everything makes sense. Yeah. Well, one, I mean, when I think about that, like the instrumentation for this piece is huge, right? So the first movement is tons of wooden instruments, second movement, tons of drums, third movement, all, all these metal instruments. But at least for us, the thing that made it possible uh, was that you spent all this time in our studio, literally like, like you did an inventory for us. That's basically well, well Vic did the inventory and sent it to me, but <laughs> I was there looking around first. I poked around and then I was like, oh, Vic, can you send me the, the list of everything you have? And then I got this like massive text. He's like, uh, metal, metal pipes. And it's like, boop, boop, boop. I was like, okay, okay, okay. And so the list the is like <laughs> this massive text yeah. going by all the instruments. No, um, but, but you, you only wrote for those things. So even though there's like 60 drums or something like that in the second movement, they were literally like three rototones because we own three rototones. Yeah, check. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think specifically about the third movement too, you know, like the yeah. bowls and like the desk bells and all the Glock bars. Right. Those are all specifically ones that were just in our studio, you know. Right. Um, yeah, so obviously it was in, for a piece of that magnitude and for you guys, it was important you guys had everything you needed to do it. You know, I wasn't going to ask for uh, Tibetan, you know, prayer gongs, you know, <laughs> that are super rare. Um, but uh, what was the first piece in the, in the repertoire that does uh, wood, skin, metal? I think So-Called Laws. I could is be that, wrong, Is that though. the first? I, you know, it's funny. I, I thought it was So-Called Laws, but then I was just online last week. I was trying to remember, and I saw an older piece. Like it wasn't Cage, it wasn't Zanakis. I was looking through all the, 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 the iconic older pieces that had this, yeah. this exact order and, and, and build. And for me, um, because of so-called laws and just, be, I don't know, it just feels like a, a thing. I was like, for my piece, I want to be part of this thing. Mm -hmm. I want to be in that thing. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know if I feel the same way now of wanting to be so leaned into it. But for me, uh, with, with a 30 minute piece, I, I want to be part of the repertoire and part of, you know, of that thing. Well, you definitely capture each of those like families of instruments so well, you know, um, like it's, I feel like it's a part of, you know, that, that thing you're talking about, but I also think it does it in like a really unique and cool way, you know, oh, that cool. feels very unique to your music. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it shares a, a scope, and I suppose those rough instrument groups are the same as, as, as the Lang piece, um, but that's where the similarities are. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's nothing else that's the same about those two things. I, I remember, and then I had, because um, the for all the movements, as you guys are well aware, they begin all with the same idea, which is everyone's on the same instrument, mm. playing it in a weird way. Mm. So that was also part of the design. It was like, okay, so we're going to do wood. We're going to find one instrument. They're all going to play it. And it's going to be weird. And how is it going to be weird? So let's figure this thing out. You know, it's like, okay, second second movement. Yeah, so the first one uh, is claves. And uh, I feel like I, 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 I came up with some stuff there that maybe it was the first. Was I the first? Oh, it's Dude, the hardest first time I've ever done that. It's ever been written. <laughs> I think it's the first, man. <laughs> I felt pretty good when I was like, wait a second here. I think I'm onto something, you know? Yeah. Um, and I remember I went into my, uh, to my lesson because uh, back then I was still at USC doing my doctorate and I was still in lessons. And I was like, I wrote this clave solo. Uh, and, and I was like, it's basically the, the composite is, is a unison, you know, more or less. And I was like, let me play it for you. So I pulled out my claves and then I was like, I'm going to put in earplugs. I think you should plug your ears to my teacher, Donald Crockett, because it's going to get really loud in this really small room. And he's like, really? I was like, trust me, it's really loud. <laughs> and, I, and I played through the whole thing. And he's like, he was like this, plugging his ears. That's and awesome. He, and he was, like, he was like, wow. Yeah, okay. Okay. You know? <laughs> it's incredible. Man, whenever I, when I listen to it, because we recorded, I don't think we've mentioned this, but, but this piece is, featured on our album that came Emily. out a couple months ago. Um, the album is called And That Too. And That, and that Too. And That One Too. Um, that One Too. Yeah. Uh, so that piece obviously I think, has I think like, just And That Too, right? Is it And That Too? How many times have I written and talked about it? Why, why do I not? <laughs> I know, yeah, it right. Hundreds of times. <laughs> album hundreds release concert. Times. Anyway. Um, Sorry, And That One Too. We're right. Oh, there I was we right. Go. Okay, there we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> beauty so anyway it's the last piece on our on our album and every time i i hear it i always feel like there's that one middle section it's like it, it, it kind of like develop it has like an intro and then it kind of like develops for a little bit and then there's like this moment when we're all doing like all the different techniques you know it sounds like like this crazy like synchronized like uh military march <laughs> you know it's like incredibly like martial and it's just like yeah, it just sounds like these like crazy shoes that these like people have on and they're like marching down this like cobbler street or something. I, I don't know. It's like a tap dance or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah like a tap dance. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's just so cool. Um, maybe For actually, the music video. Yeah, exactly. It'll be that. <laughs> I do. I do. That think that, oh, yeah. Great idea. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 play a little section of that in the first movement. So then that, that, that philosophy of like the first that first movement and that playing the clave, which is like, you know, an instrument you don't see variety with, you know, very often. I was like, let's try and do that with the you know, kick drum, second movement, and let's try and do that with uh, the finger symbols for the last movement. Um, and I was really quite proud of, of also the, the finger symbol stuff and that all those ideas that came out of that with the... Uh, obviously ian's part uh with the dead stroke and the shing you know like so cool. it, it doesn't i mean that to me that's not like i innovated the instrument but just it's such a good sound i was like really happy with with that and and just trying to maximize an instrument that's usually minimalized like just like gets one little ding and then that's all they get you know mm -hmm. giving it like this full quartet experience yeah 
that opening gesture is just like it's like the sonic equivalent of like a cold shower or something <laughs> like that like it's yeah. just amazing <laughs> yeah it's crazy Yeah, I'll I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just thinking that specifically that movement, um, you know, I, I love the, how you notate it, you know, how you notate, right. like essentially you're notating a, uh, well, let me just, let me just grab it really quick. Um, you know, you're no, you're notating a, can you see this? There it is. Yeah. Okay. So this, um, make it a little bigger. Yeah. This was by far, the most labor intensive composing of my entire life. Yeah. Um, like without even uh, anything come even close to it. Um, because I really wanted um, the ensemble. Well, my first idea was that, that we would have um, these, I guess, six lines of counterpoint. Let's see, tempo bowls, death bells, metal pipes, crotalis, and glock. Five lines of counterpoint. Mm -hmm. I was like, there'd be five lines of counterpoint and they're going to be going around the ensemble in opposite directions, you know, the whole time. So you're, if you want to follow one line, you can go all the way around the room and follow the metal bowl line. If you want to follow, you know, so that's kind of how the idea started. And then I also was like, but I also want that the, for this to, for this to occur correctly, that it goes in a single line. There's no bouncing back and forth. So the metal pipes just go down the line. Mm -hmm. This will just go down the line. There's, you know, and and so then I to do make this happen, I had to build my scale and then reorder all the pitches to make it right. into a single line. So you see there, like the death spells, the line is different octaves, different pitches for both both of them. So that way, if you play the lick from percussion two to percussion three down the line, both of them, you have to complete. It's already uh, been composed, yeah. It's the motive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so once I, I came up with the idea and this key, which is in front of you, I then wrote out the music, but the music was written normally, like mm -hmm. jumping around like crazy, knowing where the pitches were, but like all like bouncy, bouncy pitches. Mm -hmm. And then once I wrote it, I then had to translate it via this notation key onto what's on the page, which ends up looking like a bunch of white notes. Right. Um, and like I want the simplest to thing ever. <laughs> right. It looks just like uh, C major and flat the whole time. And I know. <laughs> I remember you guys came for the premiere and and we had that Temple Bowl mix up with Johnny where Johnny was like, is this right? And I was like, oh my God, like, I don't know. Like I was bringing up like my old papers, like trying to figure out like, the notes. I was like, okay, so that was a B, but then, but then if that's a B, then it went through that thing. And like, you know, and, and I don't know, it's, when you look at the score, can you, can you scroll to the score? Like, it's, it's far down. Yeah, yeah. It's really far away, but if you look at the score, you won't know where, what any notes mean. Like even I don't know what they mean <laughs> anymore. You know, uh, yeah. That's, yeah, this is close. one of the pieces that we have to have pictures of our setups because when we play it again and we look at our part, you know, it's just like C to C in a right. scale. You know, it's, like it's this. a really interesting question because, like, like you just say, when we look at it, this is not actually telling you anything about the pitch content of what you're going to hear. Right what it is doing is it makes this movement like incredibly easy to execute, like right. absurdly easy in some ways to execute, you know? Um, but like, I want, do you have any, if you had to do this again, would you do it exactly the same way or would you change anything? 
for the result I got, I would do exactly the same. Like if you go to measure 98 where the double yeah, stick, yeah. double double strokes occur for yeah, one yeah. and four, like I see your guys' part. I'm going like, oh, boy, sorry. like I did my job. Like, look at this thing. This is like a cool run that, you know, it's a walk in the park, you know, compared to what it sounds like, you know. And what it looks like as notated at pitch. Right. Um, oh, man, and- if I was to learn that just like on a – like with the pitches like laid out, you know, like diatonically or just like from low to high, it would be hard. It would be great. It'd be impossible. I don't even think it'd be possible because I mean, it may be possible, but you'd be jumping around so much. Who knows? Yeah. Right. Um, And so I think that the downfall of doing this was of course, it was very hard for me to edit it afterwards. Like Mm -hmm. even if if one of you guys was like, Hey, can you change measure? Like, you know, 99 to, to blank, blank, blank. I'd be like, give me a week yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll fix it, Let you me know? find it, yeah. Um, and so I, I'm sure, um, I know that, I don't know if you guys, if you guys found mistakes, but I'm sure someone's got, must have found a mistake in this piece at some point now. I would even know, if they said, hey, this thing should be a, a, a not a G, I'd be like, great, I'll, I'll change it because I'll have to assume they were right. You know, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I remember when I was when I was writing it too. I was going like, I mean, I was just spending hours and hours translating it and being like, I felt it was almost incredible in a way to do it. But also, I was like, is this going to be worth it? I think it was worth it in the end. Like to hear the result I got and what you guys do with it and and how I did in my mind a lot of the work, you know, Mm -hmm. I think gets the result I want. Yeah, I mean, well, because we're able to execute, like, we don't have to spend really any effort focusing on the technical difficulty of this section, because you've kind of taken care of it. We're just playing scales up and down our instruments. Right. In themselves are crazy scales, but we're just playing up and down the instrument. Right. And, And again, it just allows us to focus exclusively on the music that we're creating and not spend any effort dealing with did i miss a note there or something i mean also it's a very diatonic piece so even if you do miss a note it's right like, it's know, in the mix you know? yeah um, but no, i mean I, I i've i've shown that score to so many groups of, of composers when we give talks to composers about writing for percussion that is one of the first things that i turn to because i've never seen somebody uh, sort of take these ideas of like what information is important to give the performer and what information do they actually not need to know at all for, for the execution of the piece, taking these ideas to a really extreme level. Right, right? like it's literally cool. reordering the glockenspiel pitches. That's what, that's what it does. Yeah. Um, Vic, can you pull up um, the new Morse code uh, sketch and percussion key? Yes. Because that's another good example um, uh, of building a scale with percussion. Um, in my mind, I had this idea that that a big motive of the piece would be this like this this weird scale that I'd written that in, that would traverse every instrument he had in front of him, uh, Mike Comptello. Oh, this is cool. And so um, uh, the scale I built. Uh, are you going to pull up the, the sketch, or are you going to pull up the uh, the key? Um, first? I have the sketch here. I have both of them here. Great. 
Yeah, so this would be the sketch uh, where I was coming up with, with, with the, the scale. And you can see on the left, um, I, I have a list of all the instruments there. And then the, in the, uh, next to it, I'm trying to draw the scale I want and, and putting the, the, the junk metal where I want it and, and all the mm -hmm. instruments. And then beneath that is where I start to, to lay it on, on, on a staff. And there's two versions of it. And you can see there beneath that one more time, two down, I have the whole entire scale written out. Um, Here. yeah yeah um and then if you open up the percussion key you can see it not in my ch chicken scratch um here we go sorry yeah so there is the whole scale written out so the scale would go cocoa bowl of wood bowl snare drum five wood planks that are tuned metal junk metal five glass bottles tuned nether junk metal five wood blocks junk metal and then the scroll buster at the end but that i don't know if it's in, in the scale scroll buster is like a a scroll call like nice. a little... <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so basically, my idea was that if, if I order the instruments in this way, and, and Mike sets it up in this way, he just go and you get all these different like sounds happening and, and the junk metal in between all that to make a clean scale. So again, talking about, you know, reordering the keyboard to make and then if you pull up the, the score excerpt. Yes. Okay, that is there yeah great so you see how in mike's part 181 he's just running up that scale bottom to top you know because i've re i've ordered the pitches for him to do it that way and it goes over and over again over and over again same right. scale same scale same, same scale so he doesn't have to worry about like going in and learning it he just plays exactly what you already dreamt up right yeah. and if you can imagine if if the junk metal for example was not done in that fashion if it was like you know put in other parts of the, the staff it would be this very be a mess. angular, yeah. non-conform, like not really clean scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it, it's so funny because I, I could see, I'm trying to imagine like a performer's argument against this, if they could have one, which would be like when they're looking at it or even when they're trying to translate what they see to what they hear when they play it, there's such a disconnect there. And I even think that's true with, with note, note throw in the third movement that we were just talking about. Like it took me a little while to retrain myself. So now actually when I look at my part, I hear it the way it actually sounds now because i've been playing it for, for a while but in the beginning it, it was it was a disorienting experience to play glock bars one two three four and have them jumping octaves <laughs> yeah like yeah that. i mean i still think in the end you made the right choice again because you just made it so easy and we don't have to worry about the technique of playing it at all but it is like that there was there was a small bit of learning curve i'm not saying it wasn't worth it right it'd be like if someone gave me a piano and i'd reorder the pitches and i'm trying to right. play them like a c major scale and it's coming out like you know something totally backwards totally. um but you know and 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 then i i think that the big downfall which i i do have to say is looking at the page and you and you and the page basically has very little visual meaning right right mm -hmm. That is, that, is a, that is a loss, I think, because, um, of course, music lives live. It lives on, on, on sound. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for composers, our, our work is in the page and writing it down. And if, it, if the page doesn't match the sound, it always feels a little bit, I don't know, you feel a little uncomfortable, you know? I suppose if you really, like, if someone requested it, like, did you ever think about making, like, a score at pitch? Oh wow! Or something like that for for the movie, <laughs> like or you put it through the key. Do right. You need another. You might need another pandemic to do. That. Yeah, <laughs> another year of work to to, to undo that thing. <laughs> Not yeah, this yeah, one. Yeah. Next yeah. one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good point. It, it's true. I mean, like I think that. Uh, well, you know, on the first movement of of and that one too, when you asked me to rewrite your your section. Oh, yeah. That's right. Do you, do you still play on your your special part? I don't know if I play. With, I, might, I, would I, I think I might do. play on the old version. Oh, really? I I don't play on that version. I think I play, I play on the old on version. The, right. So so in in this piece, how many slats do we each have? It's like seven, seven. or eight, seven. Seven, seven slats. And seven. when they were first written out, they were just like all the lines. And I was trying at once setting up the slats, kind of like a chromatic scale, and then reading them that way. And I had Thomas make me a part. Did that take you a while to do? No, because it was only you know X a number of bars. Okay. It was like thirty bars of music. Well, so he, he made me this right. part that had me playing like chromatic treble clef scales on the slat, even though those were not the pitches of the slats at all. Um, and I think it was, it was cool. I think I ended up changing my slats and not having a big enough table to, and for some reason, setting them up in that way did not end up working. Mm -hmm. uh, so right. I, think I, I do it. The oh, 
Right. You wanted them chromatic instead of diatonic in a line. Yes. Right. Right. I also thought it would help me. I actually thought that that would help me technically. And it's, I remember in the recording session, I would literally miss notes that like just going one through seven as fast as we had to, I was doing the same one twice, but doing it as a chromatic scale was like a much more, it's like, have you ever heard of like, like these um, orchestral uh, people in auditions who play um, what, what, what's the excerpt, you know, it's a C major scale, like two and a half octaves. Oh yeah. Um, that one and they'll come in with a xylophone that instead of a c major scale they've re-strung it so it's like a chromatic scale or something like that <laughs> they play a c major it's so easy but they play the c major scale that way they bring like two xylophones to the audition well i think that that's Petrushka? a lesson no something it's like... um salome i think Sa- right? there you go that's it <laughs> right that the is c major it. xylophone yeah that's well, right like i remember two that. and a half octaves at like quarter equals 160 it's like really so, fast and just All white notes did. the whole way yeah oh, yeah it's insane um i think that i i have actually learned that lesson a little bit about um how it it, it can be easier to have it be in chromatic because um uh on their duo with matt and jeff they built my mirrored setup but did it kind of more chromatically so it's, it's like alternating up and down with the metal and the glass versus my idea was a line. Yeah. And, then, and then when I watch them play it, I see why that's better because you, you can, that, that, that speed you can get by doing it. It's the same exact idea that I had, but easier to go like this than like this. Yeah. You have less distance to travel if you get to stab. Right. Or and you're out of your own yeah. way as well, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah that's true. Maybe that's why, you know, you have black notes on the piano. And not right. just white notes in a line. Major you know. scales are the hardest scales to play. <laughs> so I've been I, I um, for this piece for uh, for them, and they came to LA to record it. They needed a lot of glass bottles for it, and I wanted to get a lot of options. So I started like just saving up all my glass bottles for like a good like six weeks, including <laughs> a very big New Year's Eve party where I just kept all the bottles afterwards. So they, they I showed need these. up. <laughs> they showed up and, and I had like, I kid you not, like 40 bottles to choose from, including some really big ones, like a, a handle of gin and a handle of, and, a, and a magnum bottle of wine. And champagne, yeah. yeah. And, so, and so, but so then they, they chose the ones they liked and they did the recording. And afterwards I was like, great, I now have 40 bottles. Like, what can I do with this? And so then I put them all in order, chromatic order, uh, from and some were doubles, and I got rid of those, and I ended up with a very solid uh, 21, 22 um, notes of a scale wow. um, that worked really well. Is it well. like microtonal or or just straight chromatic? I, I deleted all the 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 quarter tones out of okay, it. Okay. I mean, deleted because it's hard sometimes to tell, but it, for the most part, it's 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 pretty pretty solid, like chromatic um, bottles. That's cool. Um, <laughs> And, and awesome. I, I played a little bit of Car on there, uh, Car, Kerr oh, and I. But it's yeah. actually, what I realized, I'm so used to the piano version of it that it, it's very hard for me to, to do the ostinato correctly without my hand just being right there to do it. Like, yeah. yeah. I feel that way. One time, the first, well, T- Terry does this all the time, though, but the first time Andy made me play the right hand of Car, Kerr and I on metal pipes, so they were just lined up in a row. And he was like, do that right now. And I was like, I can't do that right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> Tell me about that. it. <laughs> Every thing, like, thing in Pillar 5 is just driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, so then I, do that I, right now. <laughs> I, I figured out, uh, I, I, I rebuilt my bottles to be in fifths, like, a, like um, the way his pan is. And then I could do it better oh. just to go do the asana just back and forth. Yeah. And it was much easier. Yeah. Then you realize the car corner is the easiest piece ever when you do it <laughs> like it's on a steel pan. Um, but I, it's, it's, it's having those glass bottles inspired me for another piece I want to write down the line with, that involves um, just a mass amount of a single sound of, of junk, yeah. you know? Cool. All yeah. glass. To the future, Thomas, to the future. <laughs> well, Thomas, it has been such a pleasure having you here. Sorry about the stream problems earlier. And thanks for hanging out with us for like four hours today. <laughs> yeah, I know. This has been this it's has so been much fun. I know. <laughs> thanks again. Maybe we'll release this video in like chunks or something. Ooh, chunky. Ooh. Chunky. Do that. Yeah. Just, I mean, I'll. I'll, an idea. More I'll for Victor. <laughs> yeah. I'll throw it together um, now. We'll see. I don't even know how long this is. It's been recording. It doesn't it's an sound. An hour and a half. An hour and a half. So. That's, that's not too it's long, actually. Cool.
It's yeah, it there's a lot of gold. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks a ton, Thomas. Right. Yeah, yeah thanks pleasure. so much, Thomas. Yeah, my pleasure. Say hi to your family. Say hi to Katie. I will say hi to everyone. You guys stay safe, and uh, okay. until the next time. All right. Definitely. Cool, man. Thanks, man. Yeah.